Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome everybody to another episode of Secular Jihadist for Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with me, of course, as always, almost always, is Armin Navabi. Armin, Hello. hi, how are you? Hi. Yeah, how's it going in the Philippines? It's okay. Introduce a guest. Okay. I don't even know why I ask him these <laughs> questions. It's, just, it's not, not like, like we didn't okay. talk for 10 minutes prior to it. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. so... So anyway, so so today one of the guests we have is someone who is long overdue to be here, right? Because we're always talking about how to have conversations, uh, how to, you know, we, we talk here with everybody. We've talked to a lot of ex-Muslims here. Uh, we've talked to a lot of sort of atheist celebrities in a way, you know, like Sam Harris and Steven Pinker, Mariam Namazi, Sarah Hader and stuff. And, and, and now we do have a, another celebrity here today, uh, someone I've been following for many years and I'm a huge fan of. Uh, he's got uh, viral YouTube videos that go by uh, street epistemology. He's a, he's a promoter and a practitioner of a technique called street epistemology that, that, uh, where, where he just goes out and he talks to people on the street and, and challenges their beliefs in a very respectful way. And um, so our guest is Anthony Magnabosco. I, Anthony, welcome to the podcast. The first Thank time. you, guys. Yeah, it's nice to be here. I've been watching your stuff. We were talking a little bit before we went live. And yeah, yeah. Not that I watch it all the time, but at least once a month, I'll watch one of your episodes. Or Ar Armin's always doing some sort of antics. You know, I usually try to catch what he's doing. You know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I, I love what you guys are doing. And yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here. I think it's. I think it is due. You know, I, I wouldn't say overdue, but I'm really glad to be here to talk to you guys yeah. and your and your your crew. It is overdue. Well. We should it, is, so. it is overdue, but at the same time, I think this is re this is also really good timing. So, first of all, mm -hmm. I, I want to say that um, uh, Anthony, you've you started a nonprofit now. It's called Street Epistemology International. Yeah. You are uh, one of the founders of it, and you're the executive director. So, Street okay. Epistemology International. The other reason that this is timely is that recently you've done um, some really uh, interesting. Videos actually, there was one that actually went all over the place with the, with a Muslim, a young Muslim man that you talked to. I think mm. it was a two part uh, series, um, and that was great. And and before that, I think there was also a Muslim Ali, girl. Maybe we also... should talk about what we like because I know most of our audience. Know... <laughs> I am. I'm getting to it. I'm getting. He's to getting it. To but it. introduce yeah, yeah. what what we mean by street. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm like the Socratic yeah, method. So... I don't that you know the the name that you guys have for it. Is I'm going to love this interview. And is Can it... I just say I'm going to have so much fun tonight? What? Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But is wait, it, wait, the, is it not the same thing? Because street ep is epistemology is a tongue twister for me all the time. Socratic method yeah, yeah, is but... easier. No. Armin, Armin, you're jumping mm. ahead. Okay. Hold on. Let me just contextualize this mm. for this podcast because we have a large sort of Muslim slash ex-Muslim audience. Right. So you have done some videos with some recently with some Muslim uh, men and women uh, that have gone viral. And those conversations are great. We're going to put the link to them. Right. But to start with, okay, to start, yeah. Armin, here's, here you go. Mm. To start with, <laughs> okay. let's explain for people, this is a big word, epistemology. What does epistemology mean, first of all? And then what is street epistemology? Okay. Hmm. Well, thank you again for having me on. Uh, epistemology means the study of knowledge. It's a very academic term that very few people know. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, p practitioners of street epistemology might even struggle to explain what epistemology is, mainly because I think there's a difference. When we're using street epistemology, we're not so concerned about what you know or what you claim to know, perhaps. We're more interested in how you're arriving at your confidence that something is true. So right. the uh, the word epistemology is a little off-putting, I think, because it does seem fairly academic. Mm. It, it's a philosophical term, I suppose. It's a it's a it's an area of study that focuses on knowledge. Uh, now, street epistemology was intended by the author Peter Bogosian, who you may have talked to on your show. I don't know if you guys have interviewed him yet. No, but you, no, you, but you we probably should probably have crossed paths. Armin, you probably crossed paths with him. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. He wrote the no, book. No, no, I have totally. Like I, I, I know him and. I do want to have oh, him on the show. Wait, and yeah, but let's, let's, define, so. let's define the method. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he started Street Epistemology when he wrote a book back in 2012 called A Manual for Creating Atheists, which I read and devoured because I was having horrible conversations with my family members about theism. I was doing everything that the book was saying you probably shouldn't do if you want to actually make progress with them. Mm -hmm. So when I read the book, I was really excited because I, it was a solution. It was a potential solution for me. Mm -hmm. And come to find out after going out and having conversations where I was attempting to use street epistemology, and we can get into what it is, it was actually improving the interactions that I was having and it was changing me as a person. Mm. So street epistemology is not arguing or ridiculing or even debating with a person, but it's asking questions to drive down to the foundation that's propping everything up for a person's claim in a respectful way where you're listening and you're repeating back. And it's been catching on. Right. It, it's it's really becoming quite commonplace, maybe, for people to mention that they've seen street epistemology or, or they've heard this thing called street epistemology or they've watched a video example or maybe read Peter's books about it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's catching on, and there's no reason why it needs to stay in the atheist community. I know that we're here, we're on a show talking to largely ex-Muslims, and that's great. No, not This really. is an excellent tool. I mean, what? No? I mean, we have ex-Muslims and a lot of other exes. Mm, in, in good. Eyes, yes. Good. And and also people that have never been religious. Okay. Well, does it doesn't even really matter where you stand on any claim. Yeah. If you're looking to have better conversations with people where you disagree with them on a topic and you want to challenge them, mm. then street epistemology is the tool. Is a very very good tool, I think, for you. Hmm. But is it the ultimate tool, or is it just one of the tools? It's one of the tools. Okay. Good. Thank you for saying that because everybody tries to keep saying like, this is the method, This everyone else is wrong, my w way works, other, mm. met other ways are stupid, and everybody no. should be doing what I'm doing. But you're not doing there's that. A time, <laughs> there's a time and place for all these different tools. That's so okay. you can relax, Armin, if you like the debate and the arguing. Yeah. I think you your approach still has a place. Mm. You just have to ask yourself, is this the right time and place to do it? All right, but, but what is I, it? I think that's a key. I think that's a key. Hold on. Mm. I, so, so what? Um, and, and this is something Armin has said before on the show is that you talked about. There's, there's several different platforms in which you do it, right? Like when you write a book, there's a certain way that you talk. You can really expand on certain ideas and, and you can elaborate them. Mm. When you're writing an op-ed, you have to do the opposite. You have to condense it and get it within a word limit. When you are uh, tweeting, you're on social media. You, you can be a little bit more aggressive, more combative, because you're, you're talking to a general audience. Okay. But w what you're doing with street epistemology is you're going one-on-one. -on -one. When you're speaking to one person and... Sort of. Okay, guys, sort of. we are 10 minutes in the show, and we haven't yet said what we're talking about. Can we actually say what we're talking about before we start dissecting? Uh, Armin, we're, we're talking about it. Let I it, thought we let covered it. Go. It's okay. No, Relax. okay, well, what, is what, the, what are we missing? What is the method? What would you like to hear? Oh, what is the method that you... Okay, so I read the book, like, many years ago. The, what, is, the, what was it called? The Path to Making Atheists? What, all right. I read that book, and... A manual. So, a manual. A manual for creating, creating atheists, atheists, yeah. Right? Uh, but I remember being, I read it and I was like, oh yeah, this is just, this is Socratic, this is the Socratic method, right? And you are saying it's different. Somebody, uh, Robert in the, audio, in the live chat is saying it's different. What's the difference? The Socratic method, it seems, tends to focus on really large concepts like what is truth? What is, what does it mean to be virtuous? Street epistemology will meet a person where they're at on the claim that they happen to be surfacing. Mm. So it, you don't usually just walk up to somebody and say, what, is, what does it mean to be virtuous, Armin? I, you usually will wait until somebody makes a claim and then you can engage with them on that specific claim that they're making. So I think street epistemology is a little more flexible. Yeah. It's a little but if you, it's I mean, broader. I mean, when I was reading Plato's explanation of what so Socrates was doing, he was doing the same thing. He would, people came up to him with claims, and he just mm -hmm. asked them, instead of making a claim himself, counterclaim, he just asked them questions about the claims that they were making. I, isn't it a matter, clear. I don't know, I'm, hmm? I'm thinking, is it, isn't it a matter of who's driving the conversation? Like it but seems that was to me, what Socrates uh, was doing as well. He was like, if, no, you read the, if you read the stories, I don't know if they're real stories or fake stories, uh, doesn't matter. The stories are real. No, I mean, it's, yeah. there, there are really stories, yeah, whether course. they're true or not. Well, every story is a real... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. Yeah, no, no, but, I love uh, it. 
No, but what he was doing is like he wasn't driving the conversation. Other people were driving the conversation. He was just asking questions about that, what they were saying. They're, they're similar. So there's a similarity there. Right. I'm not saying it's it's a completely different animal. It's probably like a, a step cousin of the Socratic method. Okay. I like to think that we've come like even since Peter's book and now he's written a, a new book, um, this one here. Yeah, Wait, how to have hold it. No, no, no. Yep. You should hold it a little bit because I cut you the way that. Okay, yeah. Why is this mirror image? Okay, just read it. Oh, is it mirror? Yeah. How to have impossible conversations. Get it. Okay. It's basically street epistemology 2.0. Peter has been watching what folks are doing with street epistemology. He's been monitoring the liter monitoring the literature, and he wrote another book to update. I think the first book that came out. But in short, yes, we ask questions during the. You know, in if you read Socrates or Plato. Uh, he's asking questions, and we ask a lot of questions in street epistemology. Mm. But I think there's, I think we we've added on a lot more things to the Socratic method to make it what street epistemology is. Mm. And it's funny because people who have expertise in psychology, psychotherapy, motivational interviewing, they will watch street epistemology videos and say, "You're doing what you're doing is very similar to what I do with a patient who walks into my office." Mm. There's mm -hmm. a lot of similarities there, so so it seems like street epistemology is leveraging a lot of the the literature of of psychology of of um, all di all sorts of dif different disciplines, including hostage negotiations, and we're looking at all these things, and it's cool too because. We can have an expert. Experts are now reaching out to practitioners of this method mm. and saying, try asking this question a little bit different and see if you get a different result. And we can go out and actually put it into play and see if it seems to be more effective. Right. So we're kind of designing the parachute as we've jumped from the plane, so to speak, with street epistemology. But um, we're, we're sailing. I mean, things, things seem to be going really good with it. And if you watch a number of videos, I would say five to ten. Hmm. Watch the interactions, watch the questions that we ask, and I think you'll notice that there's something unique going on there. There's something special about this approach. So just so for the people that have, right. are completely unfamiliar with what with, with this means, just a very, very basic example. Like if somebody comes like and says, look, oh, I believe in God, instead of just a basic, instead of telling them, well, God is fake, this is why your religion is a lie. You tell you just say well why do you believe in God and then they, exactly. they when they answer you then you ask you again ask them well why why do you believe in that well how do you know this is true so that's basically yeah. just simple explanation of the difference right uh, essentially it's really important like you were saying well what appro what other approach does this make the other approaches obsolete and I would say no hmm. but street epistemology I'm gonna just abbreviate it to se occasionally here and there but mm -hmm. It seems to be really good for assessing where a person is at mm -hmm. to see what tool would be best to reach them with. Mm -hmm. So you may encounter somebody who's ready for facts to show that they're mistaken. Right, right, right. Okay, so it doesn't mean that um, when you use SE or you start engaging with people, presenting facts or maybe even ridiculing is off the table. You can evaluate it and see if you think that might be more effective with a person. But SE is extremely good at figuring out where a person is at and deciding what tool might help them respond best to you. Right. One thing I like about uh, SE. Oh, this is. Uh, that, thank you for saying that because now it's not a tongue twister anymore. So much easier, right? Yeah. <laughs> is is that it takes people's guard down, right? Because if you tell people that they're wrong, they they bring their yeah. guards up like this and like you're attacking me, right? But if you just ask them question, and just people like to talk, people like to tell you things, right? And all, what you're doing with SE is that you're letting them talk to you, right? But then like asking, so they feel like all the attention is on them and people like attention, right? Because you're asking them about them. But you're asking question them, questions that makes them analyze their views in a way that they've never, many times they have never analyzed it before, which is very powerful in that way. One thing yeah. I don't know, one thing I don't like about SE is purity okay is that i f sometimes have had a lot of success by suggesting something and pure sc doesn't let you do that pure sc just like just ask him oh. questions like what is pure sc uh, well i mean the, the, the it can be a back and forth conversation hmm. 
a lot of the examples you see are one person asking a shitload of questions and then they end the talk and it's oh, not you a swore, back and forth. You swore, but I guess I... <laughs> Am I not supposed to? I thought you could. Oh, it, does, it doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's a podcast. No, I but, should have asked you before. People no, are going to watch this. No, video. I love swearing, but YouTube doesn't like it. But go on. I'll try not to. <laughs> okay. um, it could be a back and forth. You can, you can actually tell people where you stand on their claim. Mm. I think it's just keep it in the back of your mind that if you... If slash when you reveal your position, if they don't already know it, mm. it could make a person defensive. And that defensiveness could get in the way of honestly exploring the reasons and the method that they're using to get to their conclusion. Mm. So just keep that in mind. And there's still I've, – I've even found that – this is really interesting. I found that get delving, de differing from pure SE where you're just asking questions and maybe even sharing your view – it seems like it opens people up even more, especially if you do it in a way of, uh, of humility and you say, this is my current position. I'm willing to move on it if, if there's a good reason to. Oh, wait. Uh, um, so, so you, you're saying that you, allow, you in your methodology, you allow making, revealing your position? Absolutely. If, oh, okay. I thought yeah. it was just asking yeah. questions. No, I mean, it, there, there's no hard and fast rule. There's all sorts of different styles to it. Mm. Now, I think a lot of the early examples, at least on my channel, was me asking questions. And if somebody asked where I stood on their claim, I'd say, I'll tell you at the end, end of the talk or um, let's finish this conversation. Let's finish the five minutes on my timer, for example, and then I'll answer any questions that you have. But um, maybe it's in response to concerns that it is a one way directed thing and it's not a back and forth that – I'm changing on it, and I see other people who do this, that it can be a back and forth. It should be a back and forth. Does it depend on the person? Does it depend on the person that you're talking to where you think, okay, well, in this case, uh, maybe it's okay to for me to say what I what my yeah. position is versus – So You, you kind of just have to sense where they're at again, and you can, you can really only get an idea of where a person is until you – know, when you start asking questions and listen to what the heck they're saying. And then maybe right. you can get a sense like, oh, you know, I think they probably wouldn't be that upset because they just mentioned their friend who's an atheist. If I were to reveal that I'm an atheist, well, maybe they wouldn't be so put off by it. And I've even heard – it does have to be about God claims too, just to be clear. But I've had people open up even more when I've revealed my position, and they've even lowered their confidence in their own claim once they found out where I stood on mine because maybe they thought I was religious maybe. <laughs> uh -huh. And they maybe thought that they had an obligation to give a higher confidence level in their in their claim that God was real. And then when they find out that I don't, they mm -hmm. say, "Well, you know, I, I've actually been doubting a lot more than I let on at the start." I've even had so, Muslims. Yeah, I've had Muslims yeah. ask me to turn off the camera so that they can give me the real answer. Oh wow! Yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's so. That's what, how, how much of this. So there, there are two things that are playing here. One is the actual arguments that you're making. Okay, or uh, not really arguments, but Who's you know, making? you're bringing up. I mean, okay, so you're not really making arguments, but you're asking questions and you're having the conversation. There's the actual content of the conversation. So that's part of the thing that's doing the work. The other thing is like when you go up to them, you're a really friendly guy, right? Like, so you're going up there, you're speaking very respectfully. Like I'm really interested in knowing what you want to say. You're giving them that kind of respect. And, and people like that. That brings their guard down. And um, I, I've noticed personally in, in the way that, that I do things as well, is when you do that, when when the guard comes down, they, they, they don't feel attacked as much. And then they start revealing their own doubts mm, about things mm -hmm. as well. So would you say it's one more the other, more than the other? Is it the, just generally, what what do you think is more important? Is it is it the the actual content of what you're saying? Or is it Ooh. the way that you set it up and the example that you set as a person? That's a good question. Them? That's a freaking good question. Can I say freaking? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Man, I don't know about the swearing thing. I, I feel like I you know. should be able to say, it. but the, it's okay. I, I think know. the way that you, you carry yourself. I agree. Hey, Ali, I agree with that. You, it's just YouTube gods. Okay, it's not me. Don't blame me. Okay. All right. Okay. Maybe you YouTube can keep gods. it out or something. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I suppose that if I was a real aggressive jerk, and I asked the exact same questions that I might ask when I was being respectful and listening and patient. It probably wouldn't be nearly as effective. But it's not like I'm pretending to be compassionate and empathetic and listening. That's just really the, the, the approach that resonated best with me. And I've tried the aggressive in-your-face approach. Mm. And those videos yeah. are on my channel. You can see. But I never felt comfortable doing it. And I always felt poorly afterwards. Mm. 
So it just so happens that this approach of SE works well with my Person. my the, my nature, mm-hmm. and uh, and it just seems it just seems it fits like a glove for me, and maybe it doesn't fit like a glove for everybody else, but um, I do hope that people at least give it a try because what what we found is that even people who are very aggressive in your face, if they take the time to learn this approach, they will probably notice the results. Right. Not only the person that they're speaking with, but on them, it tends to change the people that are practicing it for the better too. How, how so? Wow. We're we're noticing people who say, "I used to be an angry atheist. I started watching SE videos. It's it's drastically changed the engagements that I'm having with my friends and family and even strangers. Uh-huh. And now I have more empathy for the people that hold differing views than I do." Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, just to, just to be clear, I'm okay with somebody being an angry atheist. Because there's a lot of things to be angry about, okay? I just think that just because you're angry, that doesn't mean you need to be an a-hole to people. That's I totally agree. I understand what you're saying. There's a time and place for the anger. Just keep in mind, right. blowing up at your aunt at, at a holiday right. or something no, is yeah. probably gonna, not going to help I her think, reflect on I it. think the way I simplify this is that ranting and being angry, leave that for atheists circles just do it with your fellow atheists um and then when you're talking to religious folks and you're trying to change their opinion then that that's when you're calm but i'm not saying don't be angry i mean there's a ton of things that they are screwing everything with like that that you need to be angry to be clear let me be clear right we have an absolute right to be angry at what we're seeing with these beliefs because they're freak they're messing everything up quite a bit right these beliefs are causing massive problems across the world. Right. So we have an absolute right to be angry. Hmm. However, when you're angry at a person that you're you're exactly. challenging them on their claim, they're going to probably remember the anger and not remember your questions. I, yeah. So th- that's and why it's going to give them it, that, it's going to give them a reason to dismiss you. That's exactly what I'm saying. Right. I'm saying if you want to express your anger, do that in uh, atheist circles, but if you're in a de- in a discussion debate format, with full of religious people, uh, use a different strategy. That's why a lot of Just people. Keep... W- that's why a lot of people when they come to Atheist Republic are like, "Oh my God, you guys are so angry and so insulting and so rude." Are like, "This is for atheists. If you don't like it, just mm-hmm. go somewhere else." Right? Mm-hmm. When we're discussing with religious people, we use a different tactic. No, I understand. However, when you're broadcasting a show, just like the atheist, I'd, I'd say the same thing to Matt on the atheist experience or Aaron. And, and I'm sure they're yeah. aware of this. They're talking about Matt Dillahunty or Arnold. Right. right? Yeah. Right. There, there are theists who will watch that will be completely turned off by it. But there will be some theists who will be because they're not being they're not the target of the uh, the vitriol. Let's just say that they it might actually break through to them and cause them to think. Mm. So it, it's it's a, it's kind of a crapshoot. The risk though, when when somebody watches us blow up at theists, even if we do it right now on this show. There will be theists that will watch it and say, or even the atheists who say, that's not the kind of atheist that I want to be. So we can actually be chasing people away if, we, if we're not careful about the venue that we're in and who happens to be watching it, I think. I, I think that there's, there's another element to this. And this is when you have these conversations in the public forum on an international scale, then there are phases that happen, to, uh, happen with it, right? Like, so, um, for instance... A, the feminist movement initially was about there was a lot of anger, there was burning bras, there was you know the second wave feminism. Um, you had that, and then that raised awareness. Everyone became aware of it. There were intense reactions to it, passionately in favor, passionately against, and then it moved on to a conversation. I mm. I think that you know we're kind of uh, we kind of had that with the new atheism thing too. You know you had yeah. in the two thousands you had you had Richard Dawkins, you had Christopher Hitchens, and these guys were like really in your face. And they were saying stuff, you know, uh, that, that was uh, very aggressive. And that brought uh, attention to a lot of people. And it really brought a lot of people on board, probably brought a lot of closeted atheists out and made them more vocal. Um, it's, they started wearing it on their sleeves. And then you know, now we're at the point where we are, and, and the ex-Muslim thing kind of started that way too. But now we're at the point where we've moved to the next thing. There's a lot of awareness. And now we're having a conversation. And when you you have the conversation, the, the tone kind of it moves on. Yeah. That doesn't mean... That I, I still think that when you're broadcasting, for instance, if you're having a you're you're putting out a statement to the world, right? You're not talking to anybody in specific, then you can say things the way that you want. They can be effective to people because they're 
you're not speaking to anybody specifically. So nobody can feel specifically attacked. This person's personally attacking me. So I, I have this situation. And then somebody will message me in private. They'll be like, I didn't like what you tweeted and that pissed me off. I'm like, okay. Then I switch to the, the you know, your approach. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, we're talking one-on-one. -on -one. Let's talk about what you think. Mm -hmm. And it really, really works that way. Mm -hmm. One thing sort of brings people to the fold because it's a public conversation. And then when you get on one-on-one, -on -one, then, then it's, it's a different dynamic. Yeah. Um, and it feels kind of natural. It doesn't feel like I have to deliberately plan it that way necessarily yeah exactly once but, you keep doing it enough mm. it feels natural mike in the live chat is saying i'm not able to do full se but i started to use a mixture and it helped me very much exactly that's what i do as yeah. well so like yeah. i don't do full se but i use se in when i'm talking i do one-on-one -on -one, yeah. yeah when se he, se helps people you know, bring people's guards down but another thing that helps people uh, brings people guards down that is not SC, and I think it's very effective, is mentioning, and again, this is something that I think SC doesn't cover, um, is mentioning your points of agreement. You know what I mean? So no, for Not mentioning points of agreement? Mentioning your points of agreement. Before I move on to points of disagreement, and I tell them what my positions are that is against them. Oh, one okay. Thing, one yeah. thing that I've noticed that really takes people's guards down is to, after, after asking them a few questions, if I notice that they have a position that I agree with, I highlight that. Mm. And I've noticed that really, really brings people's guards down. And mm -hmm. that's not covered in SE. What do you think? Well, I don't know if I'd say it's not covered. I mean, it's probably something that people will do when they're doing SE. I think it's important to recognize when you're in, a, you're in agreement. And I think I do that. It probably comes up every once in a while in a video. Mm. Um, sometimes acknowledging that we both agree that truth is objective can be a really good thing to have an agreement <laughs> so, on. Yeah. It's surprising how. You get into their <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, right. Just saying, oh yeah, um, I also am worried about voting voter fraud in the United States. Mm. Like that's a good thing to agree on before you start investigating why they're so sure that Bernie was screwed in the last primary yeah. or something like that yeah. right okay. right yeah i i think that um you know one thing but that do you agree that that's about, especially do you agree that i mean se has a strength for example that brings, brings people guards down but this is also something just like you mentioned this is another tool that is not covered under se but it also yeah. really helps in people bringing people's guards down yeah there's there's no hard and fast rule of what se is and isn't yet mm. and i think I think it would be a mistake to lock it down too quickly as far as like saying if you if you express too much about your opinion you're no longer doing SE. I think coming up with hard and fast rules of what this is and isn't might actually restrict our ability to keep creatively developing it and experimenting with it. But if it. you don't and that's the but if you don't come up with very some rules that define what SE is and what isn't it then it becomes nothing. Right. If you're too, no. If, if you're and how too, do you teach it? How do you how do you develop training materials and resources right. for people right. if it's sort of this loosey goosey whatever goes? Right. And um, we're, we're this is this is a dilemma that we have in the SE community and now as an organization as we have a nonprofit now, mm. and we want to develop some standards. And let's say somebody wants to bring in a speaker to the next ex Muslim of North America event on SE. Right. Well, that would be nice if that speaker was vetted. Right. in some way so, rather than so yeah it's so i think it's the, one of our I challenges think, uh, yeah but uh, so to address that challenge i think it's good to not to try to cover everything that is good right so it's okay to be like you know just because something might be effective it doesn't have se doesn't have to cover it because then it becomes too loose we could be like yeah that's the strength of another method that se doesn't cover it's fine you know what I mean? Like, I think if we try to expand the definition to cover the strength of every method, then it becomes yeah. an all-encompassing thing that is just becomes like nothing at all. Like, you could, it's okay to admit, like, yeah, SE is such a great method. But this other method has the strength that SE doesn't have, but SE or it also has a lot of p powerful techniques. Yeah, but I, I think that what I, Anthony, I, th I think what you're saying is that this is this is something that evolves right that you develop as you go along so yeah. if there are elements of other methods that can be incorporated into it 
Um, yeah. You know, why why have such stringent definitional criteria that you wouldn't right. incorporate? Yeah, it? Make yeah, it this is this is one of the challenges that we that we're in right now is trying to figure out how do we how do we package this package this up in in a way where it's digestible by the most people, mm. but not dissuade people from going above and beyond what they're currently seeing. Right. Mm. And um, but it's fun. People are bringing their own styles to it. We're seeing this now. And I think here's the here's the key. As long as you approach these conversations from an authentic point of view and really being open to understanding a person's position and maybe even changing your mind on their view and be you know and, and engaging with them in a respectful way, you're probably sixty percent of the way there towards doing SE anyway. So if you bring that, that's probably just a, a very huge part of it. And um and trying to look at it as not to win or or destroy my opponent. But actually help them. Mm. How can we help each other figure out what's really going on here? That's the thing. I think it, the question is like, do you want to make a point or do you want to actually make a change? Right? Yeah. Like it's, cause you, you can Street epistemology is a tool. Let me just remind everybody. Mm. It's a tool that you can wield to beat somebody over the head and have them realize that they have no good reason for thinking that Ola is real. And then yeah. you can say, and by the way, here's a great book that you can read. Right. And okay. you, can, you can push a worldview by doing that. But that's where I think the SE stops. Maybe that's – I don't know. I'm not the arbiter of what SE is. Let's be clear. But I think when you shift from well, this this idea of discovery and figuring out did I build this on a, on a solid foundation to now that we've realized you don't, you don't have a solid foundation, here's what you should be thinking. That I think crosses the line. Oh, really? Okay, so – because that's what so I one do. thing that's what I do. It, well, okay, crosses the line as in it's a bad <laughs> thing, or crosses the line as in it's it's no longer SE, but it's it could be fine. The latter. Okay, so it's not like you're I think. Saying, I think it could be fine. It could yeah. be fine. Can can yeah. SE be used for evil? <laughs> yes, I think How? so. Well, I How? don't think evil is a thing. It's a tool. It's a <laughs> for tool. harm. I think you for can harm. harm people with. I think you can harm people with SE. How? Yeah. There are some people who are particularly dependent on these beliefs that they, they say that they would harm themselves or be harmed or harm other people if they didn't think that it was true. And they mean it. Mm. Or let's say it's an end-of-life situation. They're 90 years old. They're, they just found out they have a terminal illness. Right. And this thinking that they're going to be in heaven and everything is, is the last thing that's keeping them going. You have to. It's a judgment call. You really, right? Maybe a, one of the one of the few rules of SE might be try to minimize harm as much as possible. And sometimes you may not know that you've actually harmed somebody in the process of doing this, even though your intentions were really good. Right. So you 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 you, you have to really be paying attention to what you're getting yourself into right. and the obligation that I think you have after the talk. You can't just ghost them. You should give people a way to reach out to you because they could really be struggling from the questions that you ask. Right. right. I mean, it's on. Okay, so I I do think it's a, on a general rule: spreading truth and fighting lies is more often ben beneficial, right? It's you know that's a net yeah. positive thing to do, right? There are rare examples that you could come up with that it's not a good idea. Like for example. If a child is dying from cancer, and like she, like let's say that she's in the hospital, she's dying ten minutes from now, and she asks me, Armin, where am I going to go if when I die? What's going to happen? I'm going to tell her you're going to go, and it's going to be all rainbows and butterflies, and it's going to be candy everywhere, and you're going to go see your parents. I'm going to tell that kid that, okay? Um, I'm not going to tell them like, yeah, sorry, there's nothing, it's all fake. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, but these are very rare examples you know it doesn't yeah. it doesn't you know contradict the general rule that you have to fight lies and and you know that should be your main policy right no? uh -huh. well yeah I, th I think you have to use a judgment call on each and every time and one of the best ways i think to do that is to ask the person if they want their beliefs to correspond to the truth of the matter as much as possible darn the consequences darn the cost and if they say yes then I would proceed with them. I mean, I assume that if they're talking to me, if they've if they're challenging me and want to hear back from me, like I'm not, I didn't go to them. You know, I mean, if I if if I usually if I go to them, I usually ask, is it okay if I 
you know, talk about this. Like, are you okay with me challenging your mm-hmm. beliefs, right? So I usually do get a green light. And if they come to me, I assume a green light. What do you think about that? No, I think that's right. I think when we engage with people, we're usually doing it because we value truth and we want the other person to come around to our view and see things our way because we think we're, we have it correct. Right. So that's usually the assumption whenever we're engaging with somebody, whether we're checking out at the grocery store or where we meet somebody on the street or we initiate a talk on a deeply held belief. Right. So, yeah. And, and, yeah. So Okay, Ali, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, I have another question after Ali. Yeah, I wanted to know. This, uh, there, there are actually a couple of things I want to get to, Armin, on this. So, okay, first of all, we want to talk specifically about the Muslim thing, and uh, we also uh, want to talk about the international aspect of this. What's international street epistemology going to look like? But, mm-hmm. but the first thing I want to ask is uh, the videos that we're seeing of uh, our methods. I mean, it seems really, really successful. It seems like it worked, uh, at least the ones that I've seen. Uh, but uh, have there been times when it didn't work? If so, how often does that happen, and uh, can you give examples of that? Well, it depends on what my definition of work is and your definition of work. My definition yeah. of th- does it work means did they take a little time to actually think about their views in an mm. honest way? Mm. That almost always happens in my conversations, and I don't upload everything. Right. Now, lately, I've been going out and broadcasting the audio live to the Street Epistemology Discord server so that people can listen in and see, oh, why isn't he uploading that? Oh, now I understand, because it was it was very similar to the five other videos that I've watched. There's nothing unique about it. It's not that I'm right. hiding anything. But no, for the most part, the conversations are very respectful. They're introspective. The person enjoys it. They tell right. other people to come back and talk to me. There's a buzz going around in some of these locations where people are doing this. Because their friends and family are interested in it. They've maybe watched a video or they, they've heard a classmate talk about this guy on campus asking questions. So people, I think, are intrigued by it and they seem to enjoy it. And it seems to help them reflect on their confidence and maybe even back off of their certainty in some cases. Right. I, I like Did that answer I, your question? I'm not sure if I covered your... your yeah. I, I, was, I, I mean, can you, get, can you give it... So by that definition of work, okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But uh, has there ever been a, a kind of a hostile reaction? You know, uh, what are you trying to do? Are you because I mean there are people. I, I I've had experiences where I'm talking to people and and I'm speaking very nicely and respectfully, and they think there's a conspiracy. Who's funding you? You know, why are you trying to right. do this to me? Uh, yeah. Things like that. There's some people who are like that. I, I just wanted to know if you've ever come across. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yes. Now, what's interesting oh. is most of the most of the pushback I get, or we get in street epistemology, is people who have watched the video examples. They're not they're not necessarily participants of the method. Almost always, people who participate in this love it. It's people who are watching somebody who maybe has a view just like theirs, hmm. struggling to give simple you know answers to very simple questions, and maybe they're frustrated. Like I, I could have done a better job. Why don't they ask me? Every day somebody asks, I get a message from somebody saying, why don't you use your street epistemology on me? Mm. And I just don't have a lot of time for that, so I direct them to these various groups that we have. But it seems to be observers that are seeing other people struggle to come up with reasons for these beliefs are the ones that are perturbed by SE. It's not the participants itself. And I think that speaks to, I think that might speak to the effectiveness of it. And actually, that's a very big problem when it comes to Islam. Because a lot of times when I'm having very honest friendly discussions with a lot of Muslims even though they're interested in talking what something that is a major barrier between me and them is that this really powerful thing as Islam has done is to make a lot of Muslims think feel like they what if they talk about Islam they're representing the faith and a lot of them oh, yeah. feel like they're not worthy and maybe they're not a scholar and maybe they're going to embarrass Islam. And so they want to have that conversation with you, but they feel guilty that what if I misrepresent something? What if I'm not good? What if this, what if I make an embarrassment of Islam and do not defend Islam in the right way? So they just don't, even though they want to have that conversation with you, they just don't do it. And I, and I think that's a very powerful weapon that Islam has used yeah. on a lot of people. How do you... Well, uh, not to take anything away from that Muslim who's struggling with that, uh, this is something that I see across the board. Mm. In fact, the two Mormons that strolled by about two months ago, one of them said the, almost the exact same thing when, he, when they were debating whether or not to do an interview with me. One of them said, I'm a little worried that I might give an answer 
that reflects poorly on the religion. Mm. I think he felt some pressure to represent. And and we were able to work around it. I, I, I said something like, do you think that there would be value in surfacing a reason that we might find out later is not a really good reason because then you can stop using that reason? Mm. And he thought, yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. So that's not, a, that's not an uncommon thing to hear, especially when it comes to God beliefs because I think people think that there's this tremendous obligation to – to to represent the word of God, and I can only imagine the pressure that it must be must put on some people. But I try, you know, I try to um, put people at ease that these are not hard and fast answers. I'm not going to hold you to an answer if you change your mind and say, you know, that was the main reason why I think this is true, but I no longer do. There's actually this other reason. I'm not going to laugh at them. I'll say, okay, that's fine. Let's go to this other reason that you have. So I think letting people know that it's okay to to be a little hazy in your explanation of your reasons why you think this is true and that this is a common thing that most people do. It's, it's, not, an uncommon, it's not an uncommon thing to get a message from somebody later, whether they walk up to me or they email me or whatever, and they say, can we meet again and can we redo that interview because I didn't really like it the, the way that that went. I think I even had a Muslim woman say exactly that. Wow. And I was like, yeah, sure, of course. We can meet again. I'll scratch it. I won't, won't, won't even use it. Uh, so there, there, I think there is some regret for having maybe dropped the ball and not carried you know, carried the water for the religion as, be, as best as they probably so, wish that they so could. So if I was a Muslim, okay, so if a Muslim talked to me and said, like, listen, I don't have good reasons. Go talk to a scholar or go talk to an imam. My response would be, well, if you don't have good reasons, do you think you should believe in something that you have no good reasons to believe in it? Do you think that's a good answer? Guy, uh, Ali, when you write something on Skype, it shows up on the screen. Everybody can see it. But <laughs> <laughs> you're muted and we can't so, hear you. But anyways, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying there's a noise. Of, I'll, I'll be back in a couple of seconds. All right. So, All right. so what do you think? Goodbye. What do you think? Um, can, you repeat the, can you repeat it real quick? I lost so it. So if a Muslim comes to me and says that if you oh. if you if i don't have good reasons go talk to an imam or scholar my response would be well if you don't have good reasons do you think you should be believing in some things that you have no good reasons to for believing in it is that like i think i, I think it's a fair question and it, it would be one that i would ask if i was doing se okay why are you why would somebody be tabling for a religion on this campus if they didn't think that they could adequately explain why they concluded that it's true. I think that's a fair question. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a very fair question. Okay. Now, so, what's yeah. interesting is that there are leaders of these various groups. Somebody was asking before, like, do you get any pushback? Usually it's from these leaders of these groups that don't like hearing from their doubting followers after they've had a conversation with me. They don't like that. They don't like to have to reassure these young newbie believers in their eyes uh, don't talk to that guy anymore because he will ask you questions that you can't answer and it will take you away from the loving arms of Jesus or Allah or whatever. Right. So, um, so there's a lot of concern. That. There is I've, concern. I've actually seen average Muslims being shamed by other Muslims. They're like, why are you, you are not well equipped to defend Islam. Why are you talking to these people? Like, if you are not a scholar, why are you why are you, you're yeah. not a good representative of islam so stop him like i've seen them being attacked like in the sure country. but yeah. are they are they also telling those unprepared believers to stop going to the mosque or the temple or the church <laughs> no they're not no, no you can still go and profess that you believe it but you're just ill prepared to explain why yeah what the hell i mean what is that saying yeah when you're when you're dissuading people from explaining why they believe and that's that's another thing that kind of pisses me off a little bit that you have experienced believers who will watch lay believers hmm. struggle to answer questions. And often the time that I hear, you should really talk to somebody who can adequately explain it. And I'm not interested in your reason. I'm interested in this person's reason. This is the person that's walking around that will be voting, that will be getting married possibly, maybe having kids. Right. This is exactly who we need to be talking to. Exactly. And and the, I get a little – it, it irks they, me a little bit. 
They accuse you of something like a little bit like straw manning. Uh, not, not necessarily. They're like, oh, the reason why you're going after the lay Muslims rather than scholars is because they're easy targets. Because you know, you, because you know that you can't handle the scholars. You know that mm. you can't handle the experts. They're too strong for you. So you're going after the weak Muslims because you know that they're defenseless. That's why you're talking to them. This is what they would let say. Me, let, me, let me let you in on a secret that's really not a secret. The, the professional believers don't have any better reasons than the lay believers. <laughs> exactly. It just takes more time because they have a lot more reasons to throw at you. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's basically what it comes down to. So now I have to ask myself, what's a better use of my time? Right. To go out and get 10 video examples where maybe I can upload two to my YouTube channel that show a typical believer giving typical reasons why people believe these things so that typical viewers can – can be prepared when they have those typical conversations, that's probably a better use of my time than spending the exact same amount of time with one person and it probably goes nowhere because maybe this person is dependent on this belief actually, know, for income or something. Actually, here's a, here's a, here, uh, doesn't your method really depend on the who you're targeting? Because a lot of time when you're talking to more the famous Muslims or the more expert Muslims or the scholars and stuff, you're debating that Muslim, but you're not trying to change his or her opinion. It's the audience that you're ca you care about. It's mm. the people that are listening in. Like, so even though you're, direct, you're t directing your conversation at that person, it's the people that are Muslims that are coming in to see like, oh, an atheist is talking to this guy that I follow. You know, so isn't that also a good tactic? And also, does that change the method? Uh, that you're using because sometimes I talk to people that I know I would not make this person change their position f even a millimeter for in a thousand years. I, I would bet my life on it that this person is not going to change their mind. And I'm still debating them for the <laughs> sake of the people that are following him, right? Um, yeah. So isn't that not, like would that would street like would SE work on them or we use a different method if that's the tactic? Is that even a good tactic? I wouldn't alter the the approach of street epistemology. I would use the same approach regardless of who I happen to be speaking with. Right. I absolutely would. I I would probably never ever debate with anybody again. Really? Unless yep. Unless let me caveat that. Let's say. I saw a street preacher and there were a hundred other people standing around and I thought it might be worth to ridicule this street preacher to reach the hundred that are watching. Then maybe I, I might alter the approach. But let me just tell you, you can still teach people who are observing the interactions from street epistemology conversations. This isn't an exclusively th something that's ex exclusively to debates where you're not intending to make progress with this person that you're speaking with. But it's the audience that can hold up with these SE conversations too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people ask me, "What's more important to you, the the one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're having, or the thousands of people that will watch the interaction and might start asking themselves these questions?" Right. And people do do that, and the people who are watching it to learn it. And it's I have to say, it's it's the it's the larger audience that's a better, more efficient use of my time. Now, of course, yes, I want to help, help the person that I'm speaking with. And, and if they need resources, I'll be there for them. And if they're struggling, I'll, I'll try to direct them to, to, to some support. But ultimately, this, this at least what I do by going out and recording my talks and putting them online, it's to teach people how to do this. Okay, but if the, tech, if the larger audience are the bigger target than the person we're talking to, Shouldn't we talk more to experts and famous Muslims rather than lay people? Because based on my experience, when you talk to the people that they consider as authority figures or famous, mm. you mm -hmm. get a bigger of their audience. So shouldn't you go you for, yeah. You, you can, you can, there's no, there's no rule to say who you can't and I don't like the word target, but let's say let's just say converse with. There's absolutely no reason I couldn't have a conversation with an apologist and use street epistemology on their reasons. Mm -hmm. I do think it would take longer. I think that personally, I think that when somebody's drawing an income from believing something is true, they're going to probably be less likely to be open and honest to respect you know. To, yeah, but they're not the to, target, so it doesn't matter. Their audience is a target. Um, so even if they're not open, if they're not honest, if they're not going to change their opinion mm. in a million years, I don't care. 
I'm just talking to them because I'm going to get a bigger audience of theirs listening to me and me mm -hmm. questioning them. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not going to change their opinion. There, there's no, there's, there's absolutely no reason why somebody can't use SE with one of those folks, especially right. if they think, oh, if I could just show a little crack of, of doubt with this apologist, mm -hmm. the ripples of the people who love that apologist might be huge. Maybe, maybe that is a more efficient use of people's time to, to, mm -hmm. to go after folks like that. Like, That's I, just not I something noticed, that I'm. I noticed, for example, when I went after Ali, so Ali Dabo, like I got a whole bunch of Muslims. Like what, following me to see what I had to mm -hmm. say against Ali Dabo. And not, another thing you do, I do sometimes, and you tell me what you think about this. I, if they change my mind on something, I will give them a win. Because I know if I give them a win, they will share the, they will share that. They were like, I want them to, f sometimes I feel like it's okay. Like, this is like putting my ego aside and let them go with the claim that they destroyed me. Because mm. if they feel, if I say like, oh, you're right. I was wrong. This is not real history. You are more correct on this. I changed my mind. And I they re they're like, holy crap. We're recording this atheist telling us he was wrong. And we were right. And we changed his mind. Because I know they're going to go share that everywhere. Right? And I say some other things alongside this as well. And a lot of people might like, like because they're going to go share a bit of, more of their audience. Um, I might get a lot of people, more people interested in what I have to say. Right? Mm. I mean, these are sneaky uh, tactics. I don't know if it's... It's a little <laughs> sneaky, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it kind of depends on what your goal is. I, I would just say, if, if you don't know the answer to something or you think that they, they are saying something that is has backing, then I think it's mm -hmm. important to acknowledge when a person is right about something mm -hmm. and, and show that humility and model it and say... I mean, I, I, will, I will actively look for opportunities to say... Like, oh, I was mistaken on that. Thank you for correcting me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm, I'm so sorry that that was a confusing question. Let me rephrase it. Thank you for telling me that you were confused on it. Right. Um, I'm trying to look for opportunities where I can show them that it's okay to not know the answer to something. Right. It's okay to be wrong mm. because that's how we drive, I think, to the truth of it. And that's really the ultimate goal. I think when, when both of the parties are engaging, I think that's usually what we have in common is that mm. we value the truth and we're striving to believe true things. And we each think that we have it figured out for, for here's a, for example another thing is that i have some very extremely liberal beliefs when it comes to some i'm not going to get into it right now but some things that a lot of muslims find such a got you on me they're like look what atheism would lead to right and 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 i and i love that because they think because they use that as a way to warn other muslims about what atheism could lead to that they end up introducing me to a whole bunch of Muslims, you know, that might mm -hmm. be interested in the other things I have to say. I don't know if these are, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to lie. To well, that's a, that's <laughs> a bad, any publicity is good publicity type thing. But I mean, there is some truth to that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. well, Trump is president. So I, I, I no, mean, but I'm but, not being dishonest. Like, I mean, I mean, it's sneaky a little bit, but I don't, end up lying about anything like if they change mm -hmm. my mind on something they i will just highlight that i'm not lying to them i'm like you changed my mind on something uh, well i think i think but 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 it does it does i i actually mean that seriously that that even bad publicity can be good because what what can happen is that you hear they hear all this terrible stuff about you terrible terrible stuff and then they reach out to you and they see that you're actually a pretty decent, normal human, you know, level-headed guy. Right. And uh, by example, it's because it, it's all a game of expectations, right? Right. And when someone's mm -hmm. coming up to you and talking about these topics or an atheist is coming up to you and you always thought atheists had horns and they eat babies and, you know, things like that. And then suddenly they show up and they're having this really nice, respectful conversation and they're genuinely interested in what you have to say. And they're genuinely empathizing with, with what you believe, why you believe what you believe. They're relating to you. Um, that uh, that really smashes your expectations of, of what you thought they were. And, and this is all it's about. If you have low expectations, you are more likely to be, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to be surprised in a good way. If you have very high expectations, you're more likely to be disappointed. Oh, yeah. You know, this is a basic yeah. Thing. That actually, that's actually, um, I have a question about that. Because one thing I've noticed is that a lot of times the 
us in the atheist community or communities, people tell me I shouldn't say community because we're not one community, uh, atheist communities rely too much on logic, okay? Um, and I know, mm. to, and most people are not, most people are dumb, is to be honest. Uh, and I, that's not an insult. M that's just a fact. Um, and I and I think that empathy. I love that's hilarious. I got to tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people are dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not. Is that, was that what the it's quote was? It's just a fact. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not. It's it, it's not an insult because it's not their fault. Um, I mean, I mean, honestly, like most, like here's what I say. This is why it's not an insult because if somebody can't use their eyes properly, we don't see that as, you know, as a, you know, as inferior, right? We just we help them instead of like try to like you know attack them because of or their legs or their hands. But all of a sudden, when people can't use their mind as effectively as the rest of us, we see that as an inferior. Like the, the word "stupid" is used as an insult. I think people that are stupid they deserve not our you know, we shouldn't look at them as less of us. We should, like, try to help them more. Like, think they deserve more of our mm -hmm. attention, not less of our attention. But one thing I notice is that for a lot of dumb people, which is most of the planet, uh, focusing on empathy and fairness works more than logical analysis of their views. Because even though intelligence is not very common, I think empathy and a sense of fairness is very common. Like the example I usually give is that I was talking to this person that I was trying for a lot of hours to explain to them why the, the fact that she was saying that, you know, I believe there is a God because it says so in the Bible. And they're like, how do you know the Bible is real? She said, because there's because it comes from God. I tried so hard to like try to show them why this is that this doesn't work. And it and it, they wouldn't get it like it they just like i tried i tried fucking everything right it, and they wouldn't get it but then i talked about whether or not okay so they said okay let's say you're right i'm wrong um and jesus is lord and all that and do you think it's fair that i'm going to be burned forever for it do you think that's fair mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that that clicked immediately like within seconds she got it like she was like no i don't know how that's fair like mm. she like somebody that dumb got that like this right so because people understand when something is unfair or cruel even if they're dumb so i think like do you mm. think that's we do we rely too much on logic and not and uh, don't appeal to people's sense of fairness and kindness enough I do think the first part is true. I think we, we rely too much on logic and facts and data to convince people mm. that we think we'll be convinced by it because we were convinced by it maybe. Um, I, I haven't really explored the fairness aspect of it. My my feeling, I suppose, would be based on my experience that most people might figure out ways to justify the perceived unfairness that you're calling to their attention and it probably wouldn't you may have you may have just been lucky in that situation. I don't know. It might be worth exploring. Right, what, but what they, I'm noticing, but they still feel uncomfortable about it. But go on, sorry. They might feel uncomfortable about it, but I, I I would suspect that they'd find a verse in their holy book to rationalize it. Right. So what 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 we're seeming what we're seeming to notice in street epistemology is that these beliefs are meeting psychological needs, and if you can acknowledge that the belief is fulfilling something. And then discussing what what might be a next best alternative, if if we discover that you don't have good standing for thinking that this is true, how would you still find meaningness uh, meaning uh, meaningness? How would you still find meaning, happiness, and purpose without this view? And if yeah. somebody can start articulating an alternate worldview that still meets their needs. And this is actually covered greatly in, oh my in God, Peter's that's book. That's the best question you could ever ask. That yeah. is actually no, but that you nailed it. I think that is that's it. That's, that's the ultimate thing. Oh. I think this is what the biggest advantage you have of street epistemology. That is, is the best by... question that you could ask. That is yeah. actually using. So Listen, you... I, let me, I, I had a conversation with this guy. We've had four conversations now on camera. The first mm. one was about objective truth, and he agrees that truth is objective, and he thinks he has the right religion. The second one was all about bias. Hmm. Could could you be biased in some way? And could it be altering your perspective of these instances that think that make you think that your religion is true? Hmm. The third one was about an alternate moral system that he can put into place if he discovers that Christianity in this case isn't likely true. 
Mm-hmm. And he came up with a really good example on his own of an alternate moral system that he could put in there as a as a fallback position if he discovers that he can't justify Christianity. And now we're moving on to his reasons for thinking that the Bible is true. It's an incredible series. I can't wait. I'm holding off on uploading it because I want to meet with him a couple more times and upload the whole thing. But I think that's crucial. And Peter talks about this in his latest book, this idea of a moral epistemology, that there might be a a deeper level that needs to be met first Mm. before you can – most people don't have good reasons. Let's, Let's face it. The reasons for thinking that a God is real are bad. They're not good. Mm, of course. But when when somebody thinks that they're good, that in order to be a good person, I have to think that this God is real, they're going to fight tooth and nail to still be a good person. Right. And if yeah. you can help them discover that they can still be good without this belief, right. it's a lot easier to claw through their reasons. That's amazing. Well, Actually, that's, yeah, and, that's, and I think, Ali, that's yeah. exactly what I asked our last guest in the, in the previous episode. Um, ex-christian muslim guest we had and i asked her do you i asked her do you if you you know let's imagine that okay, God, god is real god is real and all that right but in case somebody manages to convince you in a hypothetical situation that will never happen like but in case somebody managed to convince you that there is no god what do you do you think you would what kind of a life do you think you would be living do you think you would have like a peaceful life a kind life a loving life with you know and she said she will have a devastating month i think she said but then she will get over it and she'll be fine and she said that mm. right yeah she did she said she didn't believe that you needed god to be moral but that's but there are other people who will think otherwise but i i think the bigger thing here is something that you nailed is that people are not people are not often holding on to their beliefs because they think they're true they're not like that's what our that's sure. what our assumption is exactly. especially with religion Yes, because the the, the beliefs fill needs, and if we can address the needs that they're filling, Mm. people will probably be more apt to critically examining the reasons that they think these things are true, which is why I think we need to be out as atheists, and we need to show Mm. we can be good people without God. That's what it is. That's it. Yeah, it's what you have to show by, and I think that's the thing. You show it by example. Okay, so you don't have to tell people. You don't even have to tell people what that alternate meaning is. No. Like I get a lot of meaning and comfort don't and everything tell, from religion. Don't tell people anything. Ask them how they think other people who don't believe in a God manage to cope. Mm. How do you or, think? Or, or, how do you think or, the atheist down the street dealt with his difficult divorce without right. having to rely on a God? Well, I, I don't know. I, 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 he got through it somehow. Let them start thinking about how they might cope without the belief. Don't tell them how to do it. You need have to, them yeah, but, articulate it. Mm. There, there's another angle to this, and the uh, the angle is that when you show them. That you are an atheist who is a again a level-headed, grounded kind of person, and you're talking to them with empathy. You're doing something conscientiously, and you're being respectful. Then they're seeing themselves. They're like, okay, well, I don't know what it would be like if I didn't have that source of comfort in a meeting, but it seems like this person does. I mean, subconsciously yeah. that registers. It really does. Which and, kind um, of goes back to the approaches that we were talking about. So if all people see are the angry atheist who's ridiculing. Mm. right and and if i think oh in order to be i want to be a good person but i look at the person who doesn't think a god is real and they don't seem like a good person we have to be really careful about i mean the image that we're presenting but i'm not saying we need to fake it like we are we're all good decent people without gods we don't need them no actually this is what i want to touch on this is a thing i think we need to be careful about saying oh look how great atheists are and how good we are because I, you can I still be shitty without a god. Don't, don't yeah, yeah, that's a, as, <laughs> no, as in we're not just hold on, again. hold on. Let me, yeah. let me, because on a, like one thing we do on like for example, Atheist Republic when we cover the news and stuff, whenever we're talking about for example Muslims being attacked or Hindus being attacked or Christians being attacked, we have a lot of comments that are supporting that. Like we have like one million Muslims, for example, in concentration camps in China right now, right, for the crime of being Muslim. And we've been calling that out, like we've been defending Muslims against an atheistic regime in China. 
but we get a lot of pushback from our own community from the you know I, you know that you know what's wrong with this we're fighting islam and a lot of people are supporting china a lot of people even support like the killing of muslims and these are atheists right and right. what we i'm just saying be careful not to we, we highlight those right because we want to show people like yeah these are real problems we don't want to be like those like religious communities that they hide the problems that they have a community right if we have problems with our community we don't want to hide it we want to like put it like sh shine a light on it so i'm just saying be careful if do not try to make the claim that atheists are good people we what we want to make it what we want to show is that atheists are as good as everyone else not that we are you know better or superior in every way. Well, we're superior yeah. only in one sense that we got the maybe answer. the word maybe the word is capable. We're capable yeah. of being good capable. without a god. Exactly. So yeah. we're we're only superior in the way that we got the answer to one question better than the rest mm -hmm. of them, right? Mm -hmm. But other than that, mm -hmm. capable of being good rather than claiming that oh atheists are good people. Do not say that yeah. about not just atheists, but about any group of people. Any large group of people do not make a general claim about them. Or yeah, well, I mean, it's they're no, they're no different. So that's the idea. Hey, um, so we have, um, uh, we have about uh, another twenty five minutes, and we have a lot of patron questions. Oh yeah, so patron. Yeah, sure. We have some Let's really I, good I, patron questions. Yeah, yeah, so I want to get to those before before right. we move uh, before we move on. Armin, we're gonna have to. Let just Anthony speak to the patron questions yeah. as much as we can. Why, are, get to why are you telling me you go? Because I have one more thing. I have one more thing to you, ask uh, Anthony you before go, we go on. You do before that as well. We go, hold on. Hold I'm on. in no huge rush tonight, so if we have to go longer, it's okay with me. Yeah. No, no, I got to. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, okay, we'll, patron, patron, uh, yeah. patron questions. So, one last question. So, the international um, uh, organization that you have, the mm -hmm. nonprofit. Yep. Um, D does that mean that you're going to be doing this uh, in other countries and other places? And uh, the, the question is, how, how do you deal with places where there are issues with speech or where there are blasphemy laws like a lot of Muslim majority countries? Uh, well, what's the scope of this? Yeah, the, the formation of the, of the organization is not to fund me traveling all around the world or a select group of people to give talks and workshops. We've already done that. I've been in Norway. I've been in... Uh, I was in Canada just a, a, a few weeks ago. I might be going to Germany soon. We've, we've traveled internationally to give talks on this, but we want to get to the point where, and we're, we're there now. There are people around the world who are familiar with this method. They're practicing it organically when situations come up. A handful of people are actually initiating talks and uploading content. That's, that's, a, that's a minority of a minority of practitioners of this, this approach. But no, the, the purpose of the organization is to start raising money so that we can fund people around the world who want to promote this method. Oh, so, for it. example, if there's somebody in, in uh, I don't know, Portugal that wants to give a talk on street epistemology at a conference, they can submit a proposal, we'll consider it, we'll monitor it, and we'll reimburse them for the cost. So we want to start getting this into the hands of more people around the world. So that's that's the, the, the part of it. Um, and I think we're getting there. I, I think yeah. we're, we're getting traction. The videos are, are reaching people from around the world. And now it's time to move into developing materials and teaching people how to use this. And I think there are some cultural differences too. Like for example, the word faith and belief, I think are synonymous in several languages. Uh, one I think is Germany is German and maybe um, Norwegian, I think for example. So, but I think there will be some cultural differences in the way that this is conducted and that's that's great i think we'll welcome that i think that will be good i think that will be yeah. essential to our growth i think that sounds fantastic um so i, I am really excited to see the next chapter of this so um yeah. I, and i wish we could have you for longer but we're going to go to patron questions because they're amazing uh, azad Mufakir is asking uh, he is saying he's resident in in uh well he's uh, from pakistan but he's living somewhere else and he is just super super excited about this he seems like he's a huge fan uh, he's in the closet and all of that. So, uh, you know, that, that's a little shout out to you. Okay, so... Thanks. Robert is asking, what are, what are valid and invalid goals for street epistemology conversations? Really quick, though, I want to address the closeted people who might be watching this. And they love SE, but they're, they're a little restrictive in how, how they can actually do it. You don't have to use it on sensitive, deeply held beliefs. You can mm. be the person in your family who questions regular, everyday things. Right. Things that wouldn't cause people to become defensive. So when someone says, 
you need to leave that out in the sun for five hours because it will sterilize the water or whatever. When somebody makes a claim, you can be the person in the family that just gently challenges them with questions. Right. And hopefully people will become used to the, you asking those questions where maybe they'll start to anticipate the questions you, that you would ask before right. they make their next claim and maybe I, they'll start I, using uh, it on the deeply held beliefs. Yeah, I used to do that scientific, in Saudi Arabia. Scientific. I, I, oh. I, one second. I, so I, I used to do that in Saudi Arabia. And this is another thing for Azad, actually. When I was uh, growing up there, because I couldn't really talk to people about, okay, there's no God. Do you really think there's a God? Because I didn't know who would arrest my dad and all kinds of crazy shit mm. that happened. But, but I would... Um, generally talking about like well you know how do you think we came about how do you think it all started uh you know evolution i, I would ask questions about those things things that were related just to see doubt in that or even so sometimes those oh, topics though sometimes those topics are so taboo that just yeah. asking those questions could be really problematic for people and if that's the it case is, yeah. choose safer topics and ask the exact same questions like and medical people will pick up teach people the tool so that they can use it on their own beliefs on their own. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Like, 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 for example, like, no, for example, you could do things that are completely unrelated. Like, you could be in the gym mm -hmm. and somebody says, like, mm -hmm. oh, I think if you do high, lower rep and higher weight would be better for muscle building. You could be like, exactly. oh, how do you know that? And they were like, yeah. well, I read it in this article. And you could be like, well, how do you know that article is true? Uh, like oh because i read because they, they gave me a source so you could like okay how can we verify which sources are good mm. and which sources no, but are isn't better? that true isn't lower reps and higher weights better for muscle builder <laughs> um it's interesting it, huh how it's can we actually find out if that's true or not the, yeah. the, okay so that's true and then it, it's better for strength to do the same thing back to you ali yeah. it's, it's better well. for strength building what my understanding is better for strength building but strength and muscle size are not necessarily the same thing okay we'll talk about this in our q a at the what end was the next well. question <laughs> yeah so the next question is uh is is from azad he's saying what are the most frustrating elements in your experience when employing se is there anything that really frustrates you because you seem you like a very patient guy you know what frustrates me is when, when um, if I'm talking, this usually happens. I'm talking to more than one person, and I might be in, in, gently interrogating a person's claim, and their friend is getting agitated, maybe because they don't like the answers their friend is giving, or they can see that we're making some huge progress, and their friend is starting to question, maybe even doubt, and they're becoming alarmed, and then either intentionally or not, they will jump in to derail the progress that you're making. And I don't know if they're, yeah, like I said, I don't know if they're doing it intentionally or not. This might be one of the reasons why people from various religions will travel in numbers because there's sort of that natural defensiveness. So you, you can really throw somebody off who's asking these questions. So that is frustrating to me. How do you deal with that? I asked the person if they just wouldn't mind sit, standing off to the side while I finished the conversation with them. And then I'd be more than happy to give them the same exact time to answer their questions or ask them questions. Oh, wow. But even, yeah. even still, they... They will push back on that. Or I think it's time to go. You, you can know, that, tell that by your thing. answers that you had so much experience. Like your answer, Dude, I've been doing this for eight years. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I can, yeah. I can, it, no, I mean, the, it shows. It shows. In, in, no, the know. videos are but absolutely It's, it's fun. And, it, and uh, you know, what's, what's kind of neat is people will watch the videos now. I've heard people doing this. And they'll pause the video after somebody that I'm inter interviewing says something. And then they'll write down the question that they would – they think might be a good question to ask and then they'll play the video and compare it. Mm. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, their answer was always subpar to mine or anything. They might actually have a better question. <laughs> in fact, that, that actually happened today. I was, I was participating in some SE that we were doing and somebody altered the question that I had and made it even better. Right. Um, I remember in your videos, I don't know if you still do this, you're not, you, you start the conversation by asking how certain they are about their position at the beginning and then mm -hmm. you recheck with them at the end of the question. Do you still do that? Because that was very good. Yeah, uh, that's we try to ask a person's level of confidence in the claim being true. Right. It doesn't mean that um, the claim isn't true if they don't have good reasons. To be clear, and I don't often, I don't always do it. But mm -hmm. I can tell you, I almost always regret not having done it when I forget mm -hmm. or I decide not to. Right. Because it's yeah. really good for getting an assessment. The next video that I upload is going to be with a woman who initially says she's 100% sure that God is real. Mm. And then I say something like – now, just to be clear, 100% means you're just as convinced that God is real as if I'm standing in front of you right now, essentially. And she said, well, 
I guess maybe 80 might be a better representative number of that. <laughs> so that, that was valuable. That was useful. Right. And yeah, maybe if they come back, they say, I'm now back at 100 because you asked me some great questions and I found better reasons. Hmm. And then we can explore those reasons. And it's a, it's a fluctuating self-reported scale. Right. And I think there's yeah. use to it. Great. Yeah, Jaron Jove is asking, uh, and th I think we touched on this a little bit, but it's a, it's a good question. What if a person does not value their religion based on truth? Right, we were talking about meaning and comfort. What what if they value it? It's not about truth. Well, you know, it's not. That's not what matters to me. It's it it surprises me whenever I encounter it, and I I give people the I, I I probe with questions to see if they really mean it because I sometimes I think people say it because they've been told that mm. uh, my life would mean nothing if I didn't think that this was true, and uh, or they say. It, in fact, um, one of the videos that you may have even mentioned, that two-part series with a guy, I think he even specifically said, um, I don't like saying I don't know, and it's more important for me to wow. derive happiness from the belief than thinking that it's true or not. Hmm. Yeah. That's and actually if you're an honest, me, that's honest answer, actually. Very, very honest. Right. And I commended him for his honesty. Now, I, I'm, 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 saddened by the answer right but i was impressed by his honesty right but yeah. if somebody says that they don't value truth they probably do because they probably put a seatbelt on when they get in their car and they when they go to the bank to cash a hundred dollar bill they're not going to accept uh, anything less than the exact amount of change well, so they they tend to people tend to make exceptions for specific beliefs when it comes to the truth of that hmm. so then i i shift to why are you making an exception here? Why are you not being consistent? If you're if you're valuing truth for everything else except this one thing, what does that say about this belief? What actually, is what value are you getting from it? Actually, yeah. actually, I would side with them because technically they're still on the side of the truth, because the truth that they believe in is that even if this, I disagree with them, but they might say that they don't value truth, but based on their answer, I. I still think that they value the truth because what they're actually saying is that even if this belief is not real, it's useful. Mm. And to them, that is the truth. So this is a useful belief that will create more happiness than misery. So I'm going to use it even if it's false. So they're not actually, they're still valuing the truth. And to them, the truth is that the benefits of this belief outweighs the negatives of it. That is not really, so even the people that think that they don't value the truth, I think they do value the truth, but they don't mm -hmm. know which truth is that, that is it is that they're valuing. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's move on. Uh, another, That's a great topic uh, that we could probably explore further in, a, in another another talk because that that goes really deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I I feel like we're gonna have to talk about this more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the so Azad is asking uh, again. He's like, has have have you ever had an SE conversation that you were guiding with questions? Uh, that ended up changing your view of things. That's a very it, it seems like, yeah, that's, that's good. Well, good question. Uh, let me just clarify. I try not to guide anybody with questions. I try to go where they take me. Mm. Okay. So let me just, just gently push back on that. Um, but, but have you ever had a conversation yeah. with somebody that actually changed the way that you thought about something? Yeah, it's happened. Uh, there's been a couple of instances where uh, the topic would be gun control. I had this visceral, visceral reaction to seeing people in Texas walking down the street with guns. I've had several top talks about guns, and I think I've slid on my confidence hmm. that that should be illegal, that, that we shouldn't have people just carrying around guns. I think I'm a little bit more open to that position. And there's a few other things, too. Hmm. Interesting. That's okay. another that I want to I want to dive into that, but I know we don't have time. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I think Armin, I I don't know if this was I, handled, uh, this was answered or not. You said Robert Hamilton's question: uh, What are valid and invalid goals for street epistemology oh, conversations? Good old Robert. Yeah, he's yeah. he's a familiar face in the SE community or familiar name. Mm -hmm. Invalid goals. Um. An invalid goal. I, I think it kind of comes down to harm. Like if you're intentionally setting out to harm somebody with your questions, that that would probably be off off limits. I would say. I think you could unintentionally do it, hmm. but if you're actively going out to derive pleasure from tearing down somebody's worldview, then I think you're. I would rather you would just stay home and not go out and do se. As yeah. far, okay, so what's the opposite of that? Then uh, the, the, the plus side of that, I suppose, would be um, 
encouraging a person to take another look at their views, maybe assigning a little bit more of a higher value to, to truth, even though they recognize that it could compromise the happiness, meaning and purpose that they're getting from the belief. And, and, uh, and working to try to get other people to value truth too, because I think that's a huge problem that we have right now is that people are choosing happiness over the truth. And I think it's causing some serious problems. And maybe and the other Lars thing would be asking. they they learn the tool and they start using it on me and other people. That would be a huge win, where they that not only participate it right. Mm, yeah. So they learn it. Like there there are people who are coming back now. I'm doing this little gimmick where I ask people to come back for multiple times and they're coming back. And when they come for the fourth talk or fifth talk, I'm now just handing them my whiteboard and saying, okay. I'll flag somebody down if you want to question them on their belief. And I, I'm teaching them how to do it. Is so that, it, that's sort of the biggest, the biggest goal, I think, for me now is teaching people how to do it so that it's this snowball effect kind of rolling down the hill and getting momentum. Have you yeah. seen people use SE against atheism? That would be amazing. I would love that. Yeah, I've to... done it myself. I've got videos on my channel. Oh, use it against yeah. atheism. Oh, wow. Yeah. I wanna... I've, had people, I've had people I move off 100% those. certainty that there's no God in 10 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Oh. I love it. I would like okay, to, so, uh, I would like to, I would like I would like to be challenged with this on atheism. That would be that would be fun. Yeah. Okay, go you on. Can do it you yourself. I mean, you you know the technique. I've seen you use it, Armin. No, I know yeah. I I know but I want to be you somebody to use it on me. I use, I do use it often. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you if you there's there are there's a Discord server and there's there's four different SE Facebook groups. There's a Reddit, there's Twitter. Mm. There are people who would love nothing more than to use SE on your atheistic worldview, Armin. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. Great. Go for it. Okay, so that sounds good. Amazing. Sounds <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Mars is asking, how did you come to ask the right questions in SE? Most of the ones you ask in your examples are well thought out. Uh, I love SE and would like to develop the depth to use it further. So how did you come to this? I mean, I, it's, it's taken years of practice. And uh, there are a lot of things that help. So I also edit my own videos. I'm now adding captions to my videos. And when you slow things down and you're playing them back three or four times, you start thinking, oh, she was just about to explain. She's a Muslim and she was just about to say that she believes this because of faith. It would have been incredible to get an example of a Muslim saying that they be they're believing this on faith. And I walked all over it. So it helps you prepare for the next time hmm. with um, not only better questions, I think, but also you learn from it. So so just Im immersing yourself in um, you know, not only going out and having the conversations, but taking notes and then reflecting on them afterwards has really helped improve. And getting feedback from people. The biggest improvements that I've seen in my own engagements has been from the feedback I get from the people who watch the videos. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and you accept, Mike, you, by the way, just to let people know, if you watch your videos, you, you are very self-critical. And so you tell people what you could, what you could mm. have done better. Those yeah. are, yeah, your videos are amazing. I'm actually planning, yeah. like late, lately, most of the videos are just sort of end to end. I meet the person, I explain what I'm doing, I challenge their views, we end on a good note, and I have a few comments at the end. Okay. I'm going to be releasing 10 videos, 10 videos where I pause the video, and I'm going to sort of... Um, Give commentary as the conversation plays out to as a training aid. Nice. So watch for those. Nice. Yeah. But okay. guys, go donate. Like this is a lot of work for none. But... It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, go yeah. support I mean, this it, guy. It'll take, me, it'll take me 40 hours to edit a video these days. It, it and, kills and do, you, me. do you have a Patreon per, uh, account or something where people can donate? We have a Patreon for Street Epistemology International. So I don't take any money doing this. And mm -hmm. I've just recently started monetizing my channel because we have an organization now and all the money will go to that organization. Mm. So okay. don't don't worry about me. Support the organization that will help teach this to people from around the world. Do you have classes? Do you good. eventually have classes for kids? I would I would love to develop training materials or or course materials for middle schoolers, high schoolers, college people. Okay. Yeah. I just got off the phone with a guy who loves what we're doing and he's an artist and he uh, he draws superheroes and he's he is a very talented so we might have a comic series or something to teach this. Mm. Okay, so uh, next question comes from um, Mike. So Mike is saying, Anthony, what do you say to people who accuse you of just using rhetorical tricks to plant the doubts? So I think we kind of touched on this a little bit too with mm. the 
Well, that, what's wrong with conspiracy that? thing? What's wrong well, with that? I, I, I will say yes. That's great. That's the plan. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, I mean, I'll be very clear with with people about what I'm doing these days. I might even over explain. And I, at the very start, I'll say I, I I'm out here. I I'd like to pick a claim that you think is true. I'd like to ask a lot of questions to respectfully interrogate your reasons, and and push back a little bit on how you concluded that this is true. And um, sometimes I might say, well, will I be doubting? Will I will this well, will you ask me so many? If somebody even asked me this, actually, I think it was a Muslim guy, the same guy that we were talking about. Are you going to ask me so many questions that I stop believing what I'm going to believe, what I'm, what I'm currently believing? He actually just came out and asked me that. Wow. You, are you going to yeah. keep asking me questions to the point where I don't believe this anymore? And I said, I will ask you a lot of questions, but not to the point where you're overwhelmed. And that is a possibility. You might actually stop. I don't know if I actually told him this now that I think about it, but I don't have any issues explaining exactly what I'm doing and what the potential outcome would, would could be. Do you think it's I overwhelming? I want people to know what you, they're getting. Do you you think it's like if you explain to somebody like we're going to do this and it, like it sounds technical and somebody might be like what is that? Mm -hmm. Like if I just go on somebody and be like hey is it okay if I ask some questions and they're like yeah and then I start asking questions. Isn't that yeah. enough? Because I think if you explain how technical this is they might get it a little bit back to, overwhelmed. I know. <laughs> well when we first started doing this we barely explained anything. Right. And now we might be over explaining. Maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit, but yeah. it kind of goes back to being open and honest about what you're doing and what the outcome could potentially be. And, right. and uh, I even direct people to watch videos. Like sometimes the people will stop to say like, what are you doing? And then I say, I'm doing street epistemology and you can watch what I'm doing, watch a few videos and then come back and, and maybe right. I can, I can question you. I think there's just two things so, for, for beginners. Um, no, just for beginners. There's just two things you need to say. Like, hey, I'm going to ask you a, a few questions about your beliefs. Is that okay? And then they say yes. And the second question you ask, uh, the second statement you say, like, by the way, if you get uncomfortable at any moment about the things that I'm saying, let me know and I'll stop. And I think those, yeah. two, those two are all, all, all you right. need. Yeah. So uh, That's a really uh, good uh, point. Next question is, uh, would you recommend the Atheos app? So we talked about that actually before we went mm -hmm. on the air, that, mm -hmm. that you you actually worked on it, right? Yeah, I had the honor of working with a small team, including Peter Bogosian himself, on the app. And it's a great app. Uh, I think it's it's free, at least mm -hmm. the first. There's 10 cave levels, I think, and the first yeah. cave level is free. And it's a really good way. I, it's funny. Um, I don't normally recommend it, but I very often hear people who have discovered it and say how much they like it. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you can. Yeah. It's an Android and, and um, Apple. You can get it, and it's pretty cool. Right. So the people who actually want to get started on street epistemology and try to do it uh, mm -hmm. through through that method, there is an app called Atheos. I will put the link of that your, in here. Your too. videos are better than the app, I think. Just go to your YouTube channel. What's the name of the YouTube channel again? It's just my name. Just it's just Anthony Magnabosco. Mm -hmm. Just search for street epistemology, Anthony, and you'll find my channel probably. So can uh, Blonde Infidel is asking, can Anthony talk about using SE with family and friends? Yeah, you can absolutely use it with family and friends. Most of the video examples that you see are with strangers, people initiating talks with strangers, which I think is easier than family members because family members probably know where you stand on the claim. Hmm. You probably have a history where you've argued with them. Maybe you do it, need to do a little bridge building. But the the technique doesn't change all that much. But just like you would consider a venue – before you decide to engage with somebody using the SE tool, you have to also assess the the person that you're speaking with. What is their reaction going to be if I start asking questions when for the last 10 years I've only been arguing with them and sending them links to articles that show that they're wrong? So you might even just say, I just I watched this guy do street epistemology or there's this thing called street epistemology that caught my attention and I'd like to try to do something a little bit different on your claim. Is that okay if I do that? You can go about it that way too. Yeah, so the yeah, blonde infidel, the same person who asked the mm. question, is saying, I use elements of SE in my classroom. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So he does that. It's great. Um, it's it's in, part it's of the interesting whole critical thinking thing. People, people from all, I've had, I've had law enforcement people reach out to me and say that they're using it. Physicians, psychotherapists have said, I've watched SE videos and I'm now incorporating it into my practice and it's, it's, it, I'm having more progress with my patients. It's uh, mm. it's really phenomenal. It's mm -hmm. kind of scary too because I'm not I'm not it's powerful. Specialized. It's powerful, and I'm not specialized in any. I just started started going out and recording talks and listening to the feedback and going out and trying to get better at it. Right. Yeah. You're uh, well. You're very good at it. Um. Uh, one thing. So. Um. 
another so we're going to do just two more questions uh okay. one is uh could you ask people who are afraid of losing a belief because it would make them bad what it is they're afraid of and what would dispel that fear i think that's a sort of a that's a good question yeah, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. good suggestion yeah you can ask them what's i think i even asked the two missionaries from the lds church that happened to be strong by a couple months ago what's how would your lives be any different if you didn't have this? What's the worst thing that would happen to you? Hmm. Do you think that you wouldn't have bought me that sandwich if you didn't think that this God was real? I don't think a God is real, and I probably would have bought would have bought you that sandwich. And you could just have a discussion about how their life would be any different. And probably what they're going to realize, even though they might initially think that their life would be tremendously different, once they start thinking about it, Sure, there would be a cost. Like they might get kicked out of their family. It might jeopardize their marriage. Mm. Let's. We don't need to. We don't, we have to address the the reality of that situation. But mm. would they be less of a good person if they didn't think that their God was real? Or less happy? Or le mm. they might be less happy. No, le well, I don't know. You could fix that uh, hypothetical by saying, let's say your family also was accepting and the society was also accepting. Like we could adjust mm -hmm. the hypothetical. You can even. Yeah. I've even tried this. I said something like. Let's pretend that 90% of the U.S. pop. Uh, this is uh, I'm in the U.S., so I might say let's pretend 90% of the U.S. population doesn't believe in a god, mm. and they're having happy, meaningful, fulfilling lives. Would you would would you drop your confidence that this god was real if that was the case? And people have said yes. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. that means we're just gonna just by growing just by growing our community we're gonna win. Mm -hmm. like we don't without make, without was, even making an argument. There, well, I mean, we do need to be out, and there was that out I know, campaign I know. that was it the Dawkins Foundation or something. I think, yeah, it was. I think that was really brilliant. I have the T-shirt. Well, we're have, doing yeah. that. We're doing that constantly on Atheist Republic. I'm actually a little bit critical of what Dawkins did because they were like openly secular. I'm like, if you look at what we do at Atheist Republic, we're saying we're openly like Atheist Day, March 23rd, everyone. March 23rd is Atheist Day, oh, and yeah. that's every year people come out as atheists. The reason why I'm more telling people, but March 23rd is not Atheist Republic. It's everybody's, okay? So you could just be like, it's yours, right? It's not Atheist Republic. So March 23rd, the reason why I think atheist is more important than secular is because secular is not that demonized. Openly secular, like who's like, even in mm -hmm. Islamic countries, like even in Saudi freaking Arabia, it could be like, yeah, I'm a secular Muslim. Or in Iran, it could be like, yeah, I support secularism. They're not hunting secularists. They're hunting atheists. You need to be open about your atheism. Yeah, I mean, secularism, there are, there are theists who are secular. Yeah. They don't want to see re religion and government mix. So yeah. I'm and just saying, it's, I'm so, not saying yeah. secularism is not, uh, I'll be open about your secularism, obviously. But I'm just saying, if you want to fight a taboo, atheism is the taboo. Humanism is not a taboo. Yeah. Secularism is not a taboo. Atheism is a taboo. Yeah. So I, I we're going to do the last question because okay. uh, it's uh, over here on the East Coast. It's it's, around, it's, it's getting late, so mm -hmm. we're going to wrap it up soon. But um, I, I wish we didn't have to. But Me too. <laughs> uh, fun. So, and, and this is about two more uh, critical thinking. Mars also has no, a no, question. No. Yeah, okay, go. Yeah, you know, that's the one I'm, I'm reading. Because the, the other one we already kind of covered. Okay. So, uh, Mar Mars is saying, um, has has SE af af affected how you approach critical thinking? Because that term is thrown around a lot. Has it affected how you approach it or, or how you view truth and how we look for it? Um, mm. And that's, yeah, so, and, and that's actually a good, good one to end on because I think that there's a lot of parallels here with mm. critical thinking. This seems like an applied version of just critical seem, thinking and how you yeah. actually put it into practice, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good way of putting it. It seems like SE is the is the implementation of critical thinking and all the things that science seems to be showing that our brains do when we're presented with ideas that we are we are instinctively or we we have a visceral reaction to them. So um, mm -hmm. it's the, it's the acknowledgement that oh wow if I provide provide somebody with facts they might actually shut down and become more guarded. But if I ask them questions about how they arrived at their position, they might stay more open. And um, the acknowledgement of that, I think, is um, is propelling this forward quite a bit. Uh, street epistemology yeah. is not going away. It may morph into something else in five years. I don't know. Mm. But th there's too much going for it at this point to stop it. Mm. My, my suggestion is <laughs> if, if critical thinking is of importance to you and you like what you see, what you're doing, what we're doing, or maybe you're a little concerned about what we're doing, get involved with street epistemology and help us make this better, mm. please. 
because it does yeah. seem to be profoundly impacting the practitioners and the people who are on the receiving end of the questions. Have you been hit up by, or would you be interested in uh, consulting for uh, political campaigns? Have any political strategists mm. come and talk to you, especially in, you know with everything yeah. that's going on right now? Yeah, I don't know. I, I could probably there. There's a there's a group here in town that represents a political party that discovered my videos, and they're interested in having me teach their canvassers how to have more effective conversations at the door. So yes, yeah. That's how I think it not only is a conver I think another thing you do is it's it's not just the conversations that you have. It's uh, the element of persuasion, a deep understanding into how the human mm -hmm. psyche works, how human humans process uh, truth versus knowledge versus comfort and happiness yeah. and contentment, all of that and how all of that fits in together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I that's kind of what you do and that that yeah. kind of insight's something that a lot of political strategists are really, really interested in. I'd, uh, I'd also like to add to into. that though. I'd like to add to that if you don't mind. Um, we were mm -hmm. Street Epistemology International, the nonprofit that we have, and we're looking for donations if anyone wants to help us out. Yeah. But we tabled at Politicon last year in Nashville. And it was a mix of all different kind of re Republican and and Democratic parties were there, and uh, I think we're we're trying to I think we're going to be yeah we have a team that's going to be tabling at CPAC which is a very right lean right wing yeah, kind yeah. of gathering. CPAC, yeah. We want everyone to learn this tool regardless of where you stand because mm -hmm. this tool I think will help us get to the truth and we want everyone to try to figure out what the truth is. It doesn't matter yeah. where you stand on it. If I if we had that's time, I would, I, if I if we had time, I would be using SC on you to see like does SC actually lead to the truth? How do you know that, right? We so. <laughs> that's great. We S E S E all the time. Yeah, we do. Oh, you S E S E. Yeah. <laughs> that's oh great. yeah, meta. It's called meta S E. How can we be so sure that we're really helping people and not harming them? What what does effective mean? What mm -hmm. what would change our mind that this was really helping? We want to, the other thing about this nonprofit. I think I was telling you before, uh, Ali, was um, we're trying to raise money and awareness of this method so that we can get people who have the tools to study brains to see what's happening when these interactions are occurring. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, there are people who have done similar studies on the backfire effect, and we've talked to them. And we want to get to the point. We want to get to the point where we can have people study this in a scientific, rigorous manner to see if this is really doing what we think that it be is. Be careful with that because I there's a lot of stuff that when it comes to neurology and people do MRI scans and stuff, and they try to make something out of nothing. Like there's a whole bunch of data that they gather, and it's not really telling them anything, but it will just be. It just looks so great if it oh, does, yeah. if like, if it is telling you something, like if you could just tie something that is working to some neurological science, some people just love that. They eat that up, right? Like, oh my God, we have now scientific right. proof. Like it just like, look at the MRI. We scans have these colorful charts that seem to back up our, our pet, <laughs> uh, our pet view. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, usually, this, I mean, yeah. we, we want people to study, not, I mean, we want people from around the world to start looking at this and independently. I hope people just take this and run with it without our organization having to incentivize people to look at it and potentially sway the results. Mm -hmm. We want people looking at this from a very objective point of view. Right. Yeah. And I think I might actually be too close to it to help in that manner. Maybe. I don't know. No. Okay. I know. Um, so uh, I just want to say, Anthony, thank you very much for joining us. This this time just flew by. And totally. I yeah. loved it. It was Man, great. We got to, we got to have you back. I, I, I feel like, yeah. I kind of want to get into a, a more into the specifics of uh, yeah. just the Islam thing, and I, yes. I think you know what the question. Can and we have an episode? Had... Can we have an episode on SE on Islam, like specifically, like come up with S uh, SE yeah. method on Islam? Like yeah, I think, be... I think that I I, yeah. I think that would be good, and especially um, you know one of these things is like a lot of times when you talk to uh, people from the Muslim backgrounds the conversation becomes especially with Armin and I because you know we are we know a lot about the Quran and scripture so they start talking about interpretation of birth and mm. you get bogged down into those mm -hmm. things bogged but down in is your a case great way to describe it yep yeah but in your case when you speak to Muslims you stick to the really really basic fun foundational fundamental uh, concepts and we sometimes do tend to get in the weeds so yeah uh, I, I, that's just a really interesting area to explore I think that it depends on how strong someone's faith is how knowledgeable they are about their faith how much detail you can go into. So anyway, that's a teaser for next time. And I'm already committing you to a future. You got interview. it. You got it. So yeah. the pressuring you on the air. Yeah. So um, for everybody listening, um, we're going to post the, uh, what's your, uh, can you just say your uh, Twitter account so that people want to follow you? 
Yeah, it's Magna Bosco, or just search for my name, Anthony Magna Bosco, on Twitter. I tweet pretty frequently. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I've been lately engaging with people on TikTok and using SE and then summarizing the conversations and putting them on on my Twitter. But uh, I, search for me on any social media platform and you'll probably find me out there. And, and I try to be accessible. Yeah. And is saying thank you, Anthony, for the work that you do. I have learned a lot from watching your videos. Mars is saying awesome episode and guest. Thanks to our awesome host. And uh, by the way, if you're listening to this, the podcast version of this, if you guys want to join our live chat, our live chat is for our patrons only. So if you want to be part of the conversation while we're doing these, co- these uh, when we have a guest on, become a patron today. Mm-hmm. Once we hit yeah, once we once we hit 500 patrons, we're going to start translating our shows into Arabic, Persian, Urdu, Indonesian, Malay, and whatever. The secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.